are right on schedule. And our plenary uh, speaker, uh, as, as I will introduce momentarily, is currently Assistant Secretary for Tax Policy with the uh, Department of Treasury. Before she joined the Treasury Department, she was a professor of law and public policy at the NYU uh, School of Law and an affiliate uh, professor at the uh, NYU Wagner School of Public Service. Uh, from 2010 to 2015, she was on leave from NYU and served as deputy director of the White House National Economic Council and deputy assistant to the president and as majority chief counsel for the U.S. Senate Finance Committee. Uh, her research and teaching has focused on personal income taxes, business tax reform, wealth transfer taxes, retirement savings policy, and social insurance. Before joining uh, the NYU faculty in 2005, she was an associate at Skadden Arps, Slate, Meager, and Flum, and director, before that, director of a community affairs for a New York State Senator and a client advocate for a, for a uh, social services organization in, in Brooklyn. Uh, Lily Batchelder received an AB in political science with honors and distinction from Stanford University and uh, in a master's in public policy and microeconomics and human services from the Harvard Kennedy School and a Juris Doctor from Yale Law School. Lily, we're so happy to have you as our plenary speaker this afternoon. Thank you, Wells, uh, for the kind introduction, and um, that's an extraordinary group of people to follow. So thank you to um, particularly the award winners today for your pro bono service. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It is wonderful to be with you here today. Um, I want to thank the ABA tax section first for the uh, privilege and honor of speaking to you. Um, it's really a joy to be in person and um, to be able to see so many colleagues in the tax world. Um, so today, I'd like to reflect on this, what I think of as unique moment in our history of the U.S. tax system, um, and talk about some of the key priorities for the Treasury Department and Office of Tax Policy in the coming year. Um, I've been working in the tax field for over two decades, I can't believe it's been that long, and have learned many about periods before then um, from friends and colleagues and mentors, many of whom are in the room. And I can't think of a time um, in my tax life that uh, has been more consequential and I think hopeful for the tax system. Um, we really have the opportunity to update the architecture of our tax system for the 21st century on at least three interrelated fronts. And I think that uh, transformation is actually well underway. Um, so the first is the international tax system. Um, which was established in the 1920s and has never been significantly updated to take account for modern realities of a global and highly mobile economy, um, including the significance of intellectual property for modern com commerce, how integrated modern businesses are across multiple jurisdictions, and the race to the bottom in corporate tax rates. Um, the global minimum tax, which I'll talk about in a bit, um, and is already in the implementation phase, is doing just that and establishing a modern global tax system um, that will help level the playing field for U.S. businesses while protecting U.S. workers and American families. Um, the second is using the tax code to tackle some of the most pressing social problems of our time. And as everybody knows, uh, tax expenditures have long been used to advantage, uh, advance social policy, often in clunky, um, and as Stanley Surrey, the first Assistant Secretary of Tax Policy, always said in upside down ways, um, frequently they have benefited folks at the top the most and haven't been terribly well designed to achieve their commonly understood goals. Um, this has been changing over recent decades with the advent of provisions like the Earned Income Tax Credit, the Child Tax Credit, um, and others have been addressing those up upside down provisions. Um, but then there are new provisions like the premium tax credit and the ACA, um, the advanced child tax credit more recently, and now the clean energy tax credits and the Inflation Reduction Act that are really breaking new ground. Um, they are taking seriously the expertise of non-tax experts 
Um, they're delivering tax incentives and credits in novel ways that can really augment their effectiveness, whether that's at improving health outcomes, reducing child poverty, or catalyzing investments to combat the climate crisis. Um, and finally, the IRA um, provides a once-in-a-generation opportunity to modernize the IRS and bring one of our bedrock government institutions into the digital age. Um, as everyone in the room knows um, very well, um, the IRS has been mired in 1960s technology and hamstrung by budget cuts and budget uncertainty for a very long time. It hasn't had the resources or funding stability to hire and train personnel with the expertise to effectively audit the largest corporations or complex web, webs of partnerships owned by high net worth individuals. And it hasn't had the resources to provide the, the services that taxpayers deserve, including low income ta taxpayers. Uh, a more modern IRS can embark on a dual mission to more efficiently collect taxes owed, especially from um, the most well-resourced tax evaders, but also ensure that working families and small businesses don't overpay their taxes and receive the full credits that they're eligible for. And so I'd like to talk about each of these opportunities in turn. I'll start with international tax, um, which has been one of the administration's top priorities to overhaul. And um, as I mentioned, um, this is really the first time since the 1920s when it was established um, that it has seen um, very significant reforms. Our work on the global minimum tax, which many of you know as Pillar 2, um, will level the, the playing field for U.S. businesses. And we're now in the implementation phase of that work. In December, all 27 EU member states agreed to a directive requiring implementation of the global minimum tax. Korea has enacted legislation, Japan has proposed legislation, the UK is moving towards implementation, and many others are expected to follow. As countries implement, um, new questions will inevitably arise and will need to be addressed in a coordinated manner. And that's why we've established a uh, process to provide guidance on an ongoing basis. Um, so as many of you are aware, earlier this month, the OECD G20 Inclusive Framework agreed to the first tranche of administrative guidance to address the most pressing issues that have been raised so far. This guidance includes providing clarity on key issues for U.S. taxpayers and ensures a common sense approach to these issues that will prevent double taxation. While the guidance addresses many important issues, I want to highlight two. Um, the first is providing clear and administrable treatment of taxes paid under the existing U.S. guilty global minimum tax regime, um, which was the most common request that we had heard from taxpayers. And the second is providing um, guidance providing protection for credits arising through non-controlled partnerships or tax, ex tax equity partnerships, which is crucial for the low-income tax, housing tax credit as well as the IRA's um, clean energy tax credits. This guidance reflects guardrails that maintain the integrity of the global minimum tax while at the same time protecting these important U.S. tax incentives. Um, there's also, of course, important work to be done domestically. Um, building on the U.S. leadership as the first country to adopt a minimum tax on the foreign earnings of domestically parented multinationals, we are committed to taking additional steps to implement Pillar 2. And we proposed a number of reforms to make our tax system con consistent with Pillar 2 and believe that the momentum and incentives created by so many of our allies implementing Pillar 2 means that ultimately these reforms will be adopted in the U.S. as well. So I want to now turn to the second topic of tax incentives. Um, as everyone knows, there has been an increasingly impactful role of the tax system in addressing major social and economic challenges. The Affordable Care Act demonstrated the power of the tax system to ensure affordable health care coverage, and under this administration has helped the country achieve the lowest rate of uninsurance ever. The EITC and CTC have also shown how we can help working families through tax. Um, the expansion of the CTC under President Biden helped cut the child poverty rate in half to its low, lowest level in history. And now the IRA is directing that power to one of our highest priorities at Treasury, which is the existential threat posed by climate change. 
as President Biden has said, this decade is the decisive decade to ad address climate change. To avert the most severe impacts, the scientific consensus is that we need sharp emissions reductions by the end of this decade. The Inflation Reduction Act puts us on a credible path to meeting our emissions reduction goals by making the most ambitious investment, climate investment in our nation's history. And the majority of that investment is done through tax incentives. This gives us at Treasury and our colleagues at the IRS, some of whom are also here today, the very humbling responsibility of implementing this historic law. And we feel a very deep, deep commitment to get it right. The IRA clean energy credits have several goals and many no novel features. Reducing climate emissions is of course at their core and they evidence a commitment to science and innovation to catalyzing investment in both existing and cutting edge clean energy technologies while shifting towards a technology neutral approach over time. In addition, these credits will strengthen critical supply chains to ensure that investments reduce car that re to reduce carbon emissions come to fruition. And they will create good jobs and economic opportunities in communities that have historically been left behind. Like the ACA and advanced CTC that I mentioned earlier, these clean energy credits also include novel delivery mechanisms, including elective pay and transferability that will boost their impact. And as a result of all of this, the IRA is a challenging law to implement. Um, many of its provisions are not only new, they introduce new concepts into the tax code and tax administration. Um, some require very deep scientific expertise. And as a result, this has really been an all hands on deck effort at Treasury and IRS, um, but also working closely with colleagues across the federal government to bring their best expertise to bear. We've also been engaging with stakeholders and have had um, numerous meetings, a number of stakeholder roundtables, and are reviewing over 4,000 comments received to date to inform our guidance in rulemaking. The law's climate and economic impact is already being felt. Since the IRA passed, companies have announced over 90 major new clean energy product projects, representing $90 billion in new investments in critical areas such as batteries, solar, wind, and electric vehicles. I just saw a new one show up and on alert on my phone this morning. Um, we are working around the clock to ensure that the law is implemented effectively and as Congress intended. And this means ensuring that eligible taxpayers know about the law's important provisions and have the ability to access, access them, as well as putting in place strong protections against fraud and abuse. In the less than six months since the IRA was enacted, we've made tremendous progress. We've completed nearly two dozen guidance projects. And among those projects was initial guidance to ensure that we're creating jobs and building career pathways by triggering the climate provisions enhanced incentives if projects pay prevailing wages and employ registered apprentices. But we are still at the start of this journey to meet our climate goals and achieve the IRA's full potential. We'll need to catalyze trillions of dollars in private investment over the coming decade. And that's why we're hard at work. I see some colleagues who I know have pulled all-nighters this week um, to issue guidance and provide the clarity and certainty that will enable even more investments to move forward. So while I'm on the topic of the IRA's tax provisions, I also want to um, discuss the IRA's corporate tax reforms, which enhance economic fairness and help pay for the cost of these incentives. In recent years, many of the largest and most profitable corporations in our country paid no federal income tax while reporting substantial financial statement income. And while book income and taxable income are different measurements used for different purposes, they are both intended to measure income, to measure economic income. Historically though, corporations have had an incentive to reduce or eliminate taxable income while maximizing their financial statement income. And this has had damaging effects on the accuracy of both systems and have led to paradoxical results where we see sometimes highly profitable corporations reporting losses to the IRS. The corporate alternative minimum tax is changing this by imposing a new 15% minimum tax on the financial statement income of corporations with three-year average financial statement income over $1 billion. And the IRA also includes a 1% excise tax on stock buybacks by the largest public corporations. 
um, this new tax, we think, will reduce the tax advantage for stock buybacks over dividends and result in a more balanced treatment of distributions. And will also increase U.S. tax receipts from foreign investors who do not pay U.S. capital gains taxes when they sell stock, but do pay taxes when they receive dividends. Even so, some of the largest and most profitable companies, um, including oil and gas companies making record profits, have decided to double down on buybacks. And that's why the president this week um, announced that he was proposing raising the tax on stock buybacks to 4% in the State of the Union. By ensuring large profitable companies and high income individuals pay their fair share um, through these provisions and others, we're making our tax system and economy work better for everyday Americans. So turning to the last topic, we would not be able to implement any of these key tax provisions effectively without a mo more modern IRS. Um, but for decades, the IRS has been underfunded and overworked. It's lacked the resources to properly serve American people and enforce tax laws among high earners and large corporations. Due to this underinvestment, the agency answered just 15% of the calls it received from taxpayers in 2021 and audited 80% fewer millionaires than it did a decade ago. The American people deserve better, and that's why the IRA included $80 billion in long-term funding for the IRS. These new resources will do two things. They'll dramatically improve the customer service experience for the American people and ensure that high-income and corporate tax evaders pay the taxes they owe. And this more balanced tax administration will not only cut down on that tax evasion at the high end, but ensure that individuals and businesses receive the proper amount of credits and deductions that they're eligible for. This will result in uh, people's lives improving um, and increased confidence in the federal tax system, which in turn um, will result, uh, we hope, in increased voluntary compliance. While these improvements won't be complete overnight, taxpayers can expect to feel some real differences during this filing season. Um, so I wanna provide just a few examples. Um, we, by which I mean the IRS, are significantly improving phone service. So as I mentioned during the last filing season, they were only able to answer about 15% of calls. Um, since the IRA's passage, they've hired 5,000 customer service agents um, to respond to inquiries, and we're already seeing the results of this investment. A report issued just yesterday showed that in the first two weeks of this filing season, live IRS agents answered 89% of calls, and when automated assistance was included, they answered 93% of customer calls, um, which is a demonstration of how they're really modernizing customer service. Another example is IRS taxpayer assistance centers, which have been massively understaffed and under-resourced. And that will soon change. We expect to triple the numbers of Americans served at them to at least 2.7 million. The funding will also help bring the IRS into the 21st century technologically. The IRS is rolling out new digital options for individuals and small businesses that will make tax filing easier to navigate and will save millions of Americans and small businesses time and money. And finally, they are moving forward with scanning millions of individual paper returns and have already made significant progress on this front. So since the 1970s, IRS employees have been entering numbers from paper returns into the agency's computers one digit at a time. This work is painstaking and time consuming and scanning will reduce this workload and bring the agency into the digital age. And I'm also reminded because there were two references to Nina Olson already of Nina Olson telling me as a young tax student, oh, all those records on the IRS are on tape. And I thought she, I didn't know what she meant. And then I asked her and she told me she literally meant microfiche. So um, this is just another example of how this funding will bring um, the IRS into the 21st century. The long-term funding provided by the IRA will also enable the IRS to cut down on the tax gap among high earners, which is a fundamental issue of tax fairness. For years, the IRS has lacked the resources to effectively audit high net worth individuals and corporations. And together, these groups owe a disproportionate amount of unpaid taxes. In 2019, the top 1% of taxpayers were estimated to owe over one-fifth of unpaid taxes. And for those um, taxpayers who are unwilling to comply, the IRS will now have the resources to ensure that they pay the proper amount of tax. At the same time, Secretary Yellen has directed 
that the additional funding not be used to raise audit rates for small businesses or households making under 400,000 relative to historic levels. And in fact, we expect to find audit rates will decline for audit honest taxpayers once the IRS has the right technology in place. Finally, one of the department's top priorities is improving service in ensuring that people receive the tax credits and deductions for which they're eligible. Um, to achieve goals like reducing poverty or improving health outcomes or supporting working families or increasing college enrollment, policymakers have increasingly been turning to tax credits. This has transformed the mission of the IRS. Now the IRS must help people understand and meet their tax responsibilities, but also help them avoid paying too much and missing out on credits that they're eligible for. So its goal now needs to be not just enforcement, but also accuracy. And that's why we're working with them to improve outreach and reduce frictions and barriers that prevent people from claiming credits and deductions for which they're eligible for. All of this work um, should and will be informed by research on what methods work for reaching underserved communities. Um, so to provide one example, economists in the Office of Tax Analysis, along with um, some academic co-authors, looked at the effect of sending informational letters to individuals who had previously paid a penalty for lacking health insurance. And these letters explained the tax incentives for health insurance under the ACA. They found that among middle-aged adults, the re letters resulted in one fewer death per every 1,587 letters sent. So that's a pretty inexpensive way to save lives. It's just 1,500 postage stamps. This research, along with what, what, much of what I've discussed, advances the administration's broader equity goals. Um, in his first executive order, President Biden directed agencies to examine their policies and programs to identify whether and how they, um, they perpetuate barriers to opportunity. And our team at Treasury has taken that mandate to heart. We are investigating structural barriers to opportunities in historically underserved communities and are trying to better understand the tax system along a number of demographic characteristics. So for example, the IRS does not collect information about the race or ethnicity of taxpayers, um, but we have improved on existing methods for imputing race onto tax data, which means essentially making a statistically educated guess about race or ethnicity in order to analyze the effect of different policies. And last month, we released new research using this method that examined the distribution of the tax code's largest tax expenditures by race and Hispanic, Hispanic ethnicity. And our long-term goal here is to foster an economy that really unleashes the economic potential of people of color in historically marginalized communities, leading to greater financial security and broader prosperity for all. So before I close, I would be remiss if I didn't discuss our more concrete guidance plans. And as you all know, we will definitely be releasing, releasing lots of guidance throughout the year. Um, with respect to the IRA's climate provisions, we plan to release initial guidance shortly on two key place-based incentives. The IRA recognizes that legacy pollution has disproportionately affected some communities, including low-income communities, communities of color, and those that have borne the brunt of energy production. And so to accelerate clean energy investments in those areas, we'll be publishing initial guidance on the bonus for wind and solar investments in low-income communities. And we'll also be providing guidance on the advanced energy production credit, which is a $10 billion investment in path-breaking at clean energy technologies, of which 40% is dedicated to area, areas that had coal mines or coal plants close. In March, as previously announced, we will be releasing a notice of proposed rulemaking on Section 30D, the, the Clean Vehicles Tax Credit. And we have already committed to releasing additional guidance on the Green Credit's prevailing wage and apprenticeship provisions, which went into effect in late January. In the coming months, we'll also be providing additional clarity on the IRA corporate provisions that I um, know some of my table mates are working hard on. Um, these IRA projects and others will build on nearly two dozen that we've already issued so far. 
The IRA work will complement um, many other guidance projects that we have ongoing in multiple areas and also include implementing guidance on other key legislation that passed during this administration, including the Chips and Science Act, the Infrastructure and Investment Job Act, otherwise known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, and Secure 2.0, which includes over 50 new retirement-related um, tax provisions. As we roll out further guidance on these and other issues over the coming months, I hope you will help us communicate our work to the wide array of stakeholders interested in these laws. And I should note that, um, especially with the IRA clean energy credits, there is immense interest um, in scientific sectors, among um, environmental groups. And so one real challenge is sort of to translate tax speak to people um, that may speak clean energy speak and um, would really welcome and appreciate um, all of your expertise in doing so. Um, and then I should also say, if you are interested in helping on a full-time basis, we are hiring. <laughs> and I can say without a doubt um, that one of the greatest joys of my job is working with the extraordinarily talented and dedicated group of public servants um, in the Office of Tax Policy, some of whom I see over there. So um, in closing, thank you for having me today. It was really a, pub a privilege to speak to you. I look forward to continuing the conversation and I'm so grateful for all that everybody in this room does to uphold our tax laws, including all of the incredible pro bono work and furthering good tax policy. Thank you so much. <laughs>